Hello everybody, welcome to the uh, January edition of the Anthony Pink Consciousness Now in Con. Um, today's guest is somebody that um, I've swapped a number of emails with over recent months. Um, and it's somebody who, it's rare in many cases in my life to find somebody that really matches my, my own particular unique viewpoint on unusual phenomenon in that I started off very much as a skeptic. And indeed, scepticism is still my initial viewpoint on a lot of these experiences. And our guest today is somebody whose writing I admire considerably because he very much takes a very similar approach to mine, very much taking the Marcello Trui approach of extraordinary claims need extraordinary proofs. But on top of this, what I like about today's guest is that he makes a, takes a very, very rational and logical approach to these phenomena without necessarily throwing out the baby with the bathwater because clearly people do have extraordinary experiences. The question is making sure that um, we analyze them in such a way as to really understand what is taking place rather than just believing things at face value. I'll just tell you a little bit about um, uh, Professor Michael Lee Suddeth. Michael is a philosophy professor at the San Francisco State University and he's taught philosophy and religion there since the 2005. Although he specialises in Western and Eastern philosophy of religion, his interests range broadly over epistemology, philosophy of science, metaphysics, philosophy in literature and film and the field of psychology. Since January 2016, he's been exploring philosophical and psychological themes through fiction writing. He's currently working on his second novel, A Person You May Know. The novel explores a future in which advanced artificial general intelligence and mind uploading converge to create an unconventional stalker and a vision of life after death. Though fiction, he explores topics that have interested him as a philosopher, for example, life after death, spiritual experience, personal identity, abnormal psychology and the nature of the role of evil in the world. And I'm hoping that in this interview, we will get the opportunity towards the end to discuss some of Michael's um, fictional writing. OK, Michael, very welcome to um, Incon. Thank you, Anthony and Sarah. Nice to be here with you. Glad we could finally uh, have this meetup. Yeah, absolutely. And what's the weather like there in Northern California? Uh, it's a uh, comfortable 48, I think, currently. All right, not too bad. It'll, it'll too warm up to about maybe a 59 or so, maybe 62 today. Yeah. Right, I was, I'm always reminded of that comparatively famous 1960s song it never rains in southern california but in northern california it probably does an awful lot <laughs> so it's probably quite different in terms of that and i know one of the other interests that we, we share an interest in is rock music as well which um also yep. we can touch upon if we get the opportunity right okay we we've got about an hour and a half in this show because we've started slightly later than normal and sir will be disappearing um from us in around about an hour's time so we'll be drawing her in as quickly as we possibly can as well so let's go straight in. One of the areas that we share a great interest in, Michael, is um, religion and religious beliefs. And when I was at university a million and one years ago, um, one of the areas I, I studied and I did a course on and, and wrote um, a number of um, papers on is the sociology of religion. And it's an area we're both very interested in. But in terms of you, um, what has been some of the important aspects of your own exploration into religion and spirituality? Because I know your spiritual journey has been quite extraordinary. Yeah, so uh, from my teens into my early 30s, I was a Christian and uh, actually a variety of uh, different Christian traditions during that uh, stretch of time, uh, basically Protestant uh, and in the historical Protestant tradition, uh, uh, Calvinism uh, for a good stretch of that. Uh, so, you know, that was an interesting uh, period of time. And I think it's important to, to emphasize that it was my interest in reflecting on my faith commitments that got me interested in philosophy. Right? So mm -hmm. uh, questions about the nature of knowledge, for example. So epistemology was something I was very interested in. Uh, and that's what kind of got me into philosophy. Uh, at, at, at a certain point in my teaching, uh, I moved toward the Eastern traditions, and that was in the context of teaching world religions, which uh, I had been teaching for a number of years, uh, but it was really through sort of exploring 
the texts uh, such as uh, the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita that uh, I, I just kind of found myself kind of connecting more with uh, Eastern spirituality. And, and I think in, in many ways it paralleled my early connection with Christianity. I think there's a very powerful experiential dimension to uh, our, our connecting to religion and spirituality. Uh, so it was through teaching those texts that I really moved into the Eastern traditions. Uh, I practiced uh, Vaishnavism, which is a, a devotional bhakti tradition of India for a, for a few years, which makes a lot of sense as a kind of transition from Christianity, which is theistic, into a theistic uh, Vedic tradition. Uh, I then gradually moved into Advaita Vedanta, a uh, tradition of non-duality. Uh, spent a lot of time uh, reading um, Adi Shankaracharya and other later Vedantins in the, in the non-dual tradition. Uh, and then that gradually led me into Zen Buddhism, which again, I think is a, is a understandable kind of transition, right? From uh, one particular non-dual tradition to another. Uh, and of course I lived in a, in a Zen uh, center for a year and a half. One of the important takeaways from, from all of this for me is the realization that there's a profoundly experiential element to uh, the religious traditions of the world, be they West or, or East. And the sacred texts of these traditions uh, really do embody, right, uh, and, and represent an attempt to kind of articulate uh, very profound transformative experiences. Uh, the other thing that I've picked up on that I think is really important is if you want to have a, um, a deep understanding of traditions, it's really important to engage in the practices that are at the heart of these traditions. Um, and so one of the things I think that's enhanced my teaching of world religions is to be able to not only speak from a scholarly viewpoint about the teachings and uh, practices of the traditions, but to kind of understand them from the inside, you know, having practiced. Uh, and, and I think that's particularly true for traditions like Buddhism uh, and, and also the Vedic traditions yeah, you, you really learn a lot just from the practice. And then you realize when you hear, you know, individuals talk about these traditions, you know immediately whether they practice them or not. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's very clear that uh, there, there's, there's a element in their understanding that is kind of missing. And what's missing is the experience uh, and the practice, right? I think those are really important elements. Yeah, so those are some of my takeaways, uh, you know, concisely stated. Mm -hmm. uh, and really, by the way, that, that's one of the insights of William James, right? That uh, the varieties of religious experience, one of my favorite texts uh, that I've taught for many years, I think James had it right, that there is this profoundly experiential element right to the religious and spiritual traditions. And like James, I, I agree that it's important to see uh, spirituality in its wider psychological framework. And that's of course, another um, kind of insight that I've sort of developed along the way is you can learn a lot about yourself, right? Through uh, mm -hmm. engaging with these traditions uh, I think that's a really important part of those traditions. Absolutely. Well, I think it's intriguing, isn't it? You know, that when you, you look at the, um, the, the, the Protestant tradition of, of mysticism, I'm particularly reminded of people like Jakob Bome. And uh, I know many years ago, I was particularly influenced by a statement he made about you could go insane by actually just looking on a pewter dish. And the idea of just looking into yourself in terms of spiritual experiences and yeah. 
I think there's, there's people tend to assume, you know, that the mystical tradition within Christianity is very much within Roman Catholicism with people like Teresa of Avila. But of course, there's very much a similar tradition within within Protestantism and particularly the, the more the harder forms of Protestantism, for want of a better term, you know, into the Calvinist tradition. But one of the things that I, I, I would like just to focus in on here for a second is so that the people who are watching and the people who will ultimately watch this on uh, on Facebook, uh, on, on YouTube, I should say, is to, to explain in greater detail when you use the term non-dualist. It's a very precise term and it's a very fascinating one. And I know you intimated on a lot of the implications of non-dualism, but can you just explain exactly what you mean by non-dualism and indeed how that can be applied to a lot of the esoteric phenomena that people people have the you know that have experienced for centuries yeah so i, I think there's a fairly standard way i refer to as kind of our, our default cognition uh which is facilitated by our language acquisition and uh, our conceptual development with that that we we experience the world with a fairly rigid subject object distinction right as right now i can clearly experienced you as other than me. Uh, the non-dual traditions uh, in, in, in various ways uh, present us with a challenge to that default way of, of thinking. Uh, it, it Not so much that there isn't such a distinction, but that our understanding of that distinction is flawed in that we think that there's something rigid about that distinction. Uh, Obviously, in Advaita Vedanta, um, Advaita just means, right, not to. Uh, Vedanta, literally, end of the Vedas, end of knowledge. And this is an important notion throughout the Vedic traditions, but in particular, in the tradition associated with um, Shankar, that the rigid distinction between subject and object, and that includes the subject-object distinction between yourself and a god um, is not ultimate. Um, it's, it's, it's illusory in the sense of being a temporary um, manifestation of an underlying unity or oneness, right? Which uh, is just consciousness as such, right? Uh, so another way of, of putting this is that we can talk about um, consciousness and its content. Um, the dualistic aspects to our experience belong to the content in consciousness. Um, in the non-dual traditions, it's consciousness that is the abiding presence, right? Um, that is what, well, many of them will say is eternal, right? Uh, uh, yeah, so when you're dealing with non-duality, you're dealing with the realization that the subject object relationship is not what you initially think that it is, that it's uh, lots of fanciful and metaphorical ways of describing it as oneness dancing um, with itself, right? this idea. Uh, but it is really essential to these traditions that it's that realization of the provisional uh, nature of the subject object relationship that liberates us from the one thing that we all seek to be liberated from namely suffering. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I think that's an important part of these traditions. And really, you know, for me, I mean, because if you're a theist, um, I mean, typically theists are going to see that subject object duality between self and God as something fairly rigid. Uh, there are exceptions, obviously, uh, you know, but for me, the, the way it sort of you, you sort of dissolve that subject object relationship is uh, it is obviously the meditation practices are very important in order to bring a certain scrutiny to what you normally assume about your experience and that relationship between yourself and God. Uh, yeah, I love what Meister Eckhart says, speaking of a, a Catholic uh, mystic that it is the realization that the eye by which I see God is the eye by which God sees me. Mm. Uh, it's one knowledge and one love. 
so I think that's a really important. Do you know, that very reminds me very much of a very famous drawing that uh, John Archibald Wheeler, the quantum physicist, yeah. did of the eye observing the eye. <clears throat> And it's this idea, isn't it? And again, from the sublime to the ridiculous, well, not so much to the ridiculous, but the Bill Hicks quote, you know, that we're all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. And I think this is of profound significance. And I think your point is so well made here, you know, that the concept of God is within and without and, and the basis of everything is consciousness. I mean, one of the things I noticed, I'm going to draw Sarah in here now very quickly, actually, because I noticed that you've changed very slightly, Sarah, in terms of your um, your Facebook um, banner where you're, you're talking about pandeism um, uh, and pantheism as a, as a concept and everything else. So I wonder if you'd have any comments to make at this point. Well, I'm, I'm finding getting older, I'm returning to ideas that I had when I was a kid. And I had a lot of ideas about the nature of reality as a child. I thought about it quite a lot. And uh, my idea when I was little was that um, reality was like a spider's web and uh with beads of dew on it and we were kind of within the beads of dew and reflecting everything at the same time so kind of good lord that's Ind indra's indra's web isn't it <laughs> yeah um so i think it's a way of um reconciling science and um modern thinking and philosophy with with an idea of being spiritual which is acceptable because consciousness is something we can recognize i think there are probably going to be great leaps and bounds in science with regards to this over the next couple of decades when we do start to recognize more things as being conscious or being part of a pattern so um you know i like rupert sheldrake's morphic um resonance and uh morphogenesis from alan turing and this idea that there is we are like functioning as one organism as a planet and then beyond that cosmically it could be said that we're functioning as a almighty being. Well, of course, it comes down, doesn't it, to Aldous Huxley and his concept of the perennial philosophy and the idea that within all religions there are these nuggets of truth. And I, I genuinely believe the nugget of truth is non-duality. And it's something over the years that has become more and more intriguing to me. But Michael's point, I think, was an excellent one where you made it, where it is a matter of having to experience the inner enlightenment that takes place when you follow religious practices and when you follow meditative practices and you have to experience it don't you because you can't it's 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 an emotive it's an emotional reaction to circumstances rather than an intellectual would you agree with that uh in part yeah i mean i think that it's uh sort of a a, a whole response right um a lot of things get recalibrated uh, but yeah, I, I mean, our, to the extent that our, our thinking is subject object duality oriented, yeah, uh, you, it's not so much um, dissolving that, but it is a matter of being able to see it uh, differently. If, and that's even hard to, you know, uh, describe the, that element of the experience. I, I do want to underscore one point, though, and this is a, uh, you know, if, if you read a lot, you know, a lot of the Advaita Vedantins, uh, especially in the tradition of Shankar, uh, there, there, you know, there's an, an attempt to try to extrapolate a particular kind of metaphysics from, you know, uh, the metaphysics of non-duality. Uh, I, I don't go that far. Uh, so I, I always am very careful to uh, bracket out from the point of view of experience, right? Uh, this is what is happening. And that's true also about um, Buddhism. Um, uh, you know, when the Buddha talks about Amitya impermanence, he's not giving a scientific theory. I mean, that's very clear in the reading of the Pali Canon. Um, he's talking about objects as they arise in consciousness, thoughts, feelings, and sensations. None of these are permanent. And the self-concept that arises uh, is actually among those objects it also is impermanent. And this is the central notion of, of anatta, no self. Uh, I, there's a lot of misreading, Westerners often misread Buddhism uh, as, as making uh, very strong metaphysical claims. Uh, you can find some Buddhists that certainly sound that way, but uh, it's certainly not the only interpretation. And 
I tend to go more with the um, the non metaphysical or we might say the um, phenomenological right view of of this because that's where suffering arises from mm. right it's, it's not something out there happening it's something in here happening so you got to get it fixed in here right so uh, yeah and that's also the basis for the Buddha distinguishing between speculative questions right that go beyond what we can know uh, introspectively and extrospectively uh, to a lot of theorizing he didn't see these as useful for cessation um, we're still um, unsatisfied <laughs> so uh, yeah so I just wanted to put that in because non-duality today gets uh, spawn in a lot of different ways right in, in terms of different metaphysics of idealism and so forth and you know I, I would want to make some qualifications in there I'm, I'm my own view yeah absolutely and very quickly and, and i mean this this is this is like asking somebody to describe the universe but in terms of um the subtle differences because do i understand it that you've now in your journey you settled on into zen uh, and what is it that is attracts you and is different about the zen philosophy that that you think is particularly relevant to your search for spiritual truth yeah um yeah, because uh, I don't know if you mean Zen as opposed to other Buddhist traditions. Uh, some of this is just a matter of uh, randomness of my moving into Zen as, as a non-dual tradition. Uh, there are other non-dual Buddhist traditions. Uh, so one way I would capture this is, well, first of all, I, I don't identify as, as a Buddhist. Um, in a, in a weird way, that's kind of very Buddhist. Um, uh, so that to, you know, to this labeling business that we're all involved in, which is functionally useful. But well, as Groucho Marx said, you don't want to be a member of a club that would have, accept you as a member. Yeah, right, right. Uh, I mean, it's convenient functionally to, to use labels, uh, but it's important we not get too carried away with them. Uh, so, you know, I, I went to a Zen Center, which is a kind of quasi monastery in, in the summer of 2014, ostensibly just to spend a few months there while I was working on my book on life after death. And the interesting thing about it is I didn't do any work on my book for those three months in the summer. I just got really into living in the forest, uh, which is where the center is located in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and uh, engaging in the practice and exploring myself and some of the incidents that had precipitated my going into the uh, center um, for a kind of retreat, but it was supposed to be a writing retreat. But what it became, Anthony, was a, a retreat in which there was self-discovery uh, in, in, in a loose sense of an understanding, right, of, of my own life in a way that uh, was transformative, right? Uh, not not in some like sudden experience, but, but you know, if you, if you sit long enough, um, you know, for 20 minutes a day or longer and just look at a wall, you, you discover a lot of things about yourself, <laughs> right? <laughs> like the one thing you, you, you learn immediately is just like how much stuff is below the surface, right? That is governing what you're doing and how you're reacting to people and so forth. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that kind of kept me there for a year and a half was I didn't, you know, I wanted to continue that journey. And uh, eventually I did get to my book. Uh, but, you know, for me, it was, I'm learning something about myself, uh, people around me, uh, when I would come off the mountain, so to speak, and interact with family and friends, noticed that I was different. Uh, but in, in, in a good and what they would describe as a good way. And so it seemed that it was changing my relationship to people in, in a, you know, in an optimal way. And I, I wanted to continue to pursue that. And I wanted to kind of cut through the layers, you know, of my psyche and better understand uh, myself, uh, not only in just in the interest of self understanding, but a transformation that's going to have a positive impact on other people. Uh, I also, at the time, was doing a lot of work in uh, internal family systems um, therapy, and it seemed to me there were some very interesting connections 
between that Western therapeutic modality, which deals with the mo multiplicity that we label self. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought that was, it was very fascinating in how mindfulness practice interfaced with the kinds of techniques that were being used in IFS. Uh, that was just fascinating to me. And, you know, I, I was gaining, uh, you know, a very interesting perspective uh, on, on my life and people in my life. So what's kept me there, again, I say I don't identify as a Buddhist, but I continue the mindfulness practice. And uh, I, I think it's a very useful practice at one level, just as kind of a kind of executive stress ball, so to speak. Uh, it's always a nice go-to technique to have to lower your stress levels. But I think it's more important for the insights we can have about consciousness, right? And, and uh, so a lot of what I think about this is the sort of thing that Sam Harris discusses in his book, Waking Up, A Guide to Spirituality Without Religion. Um, yeah, I think, I think he's right about a lot of what he says about the utility of uh, meditation. Uh, bo both in the non-dual and, and also the dualistic traditions. Yeah, so that's what keeps me, keeps me in it, uh, is I think there's uh, something there that is crucial to our lives. Uh, Zen, like, so Zen is what, like finding satisfaction in any moment in life is one way of capturing an aspect of, of Zen. Uh, or Suzuki said in Zen mind, beginner's mind, I mean, having the beginner's mind is being open to um, all possibilities. Um, and we can maybe come back to this when we talk about life after death. Because uh, I think that's, that's an important element too, um, to have a, an appreciation of the wide range of possibilities for how we conceive about life after death, uh, should there be such a thing. Uh, yeah, so I, you know, I think people want to find satisfaction in life. Uh, I, I think one of the things that Zen or many of these other traditions illuminate is how we're looking in the wrong places because we think that it's something separate from what is already intrinsic to consciousness. And really, think about it. We're like, what are the things that we fear? We fear losing what we have or not getting what we want. And this is the one thing that I think is the ongoing obstacle uh, to falling in love with where you are, right? To use that language. I mean, even enlightenment, uh, I, don't, I don't think of it as a state of consciousness. I think of it simply as an intrinsic feature of consciousness. Uh, when I talk to my students about this in various courses, I usually just like begin with the statement that um, there's nothing you can do um, and nothing I can do to make you more awake than you already are. That, and, you know, in a way it's a kind of, uh, it's designed to just kind of throw their thinking off because that's what you often have to do is just throw your thinking off. It's like, well, what does that mean then? Uh, it means that what you're looking for is already present. And mm -hmm. curiously enough, that's the only place we can ever be. Because from the point of view of experience, it's always now, right? Isn't it? What, what is the future? It's our anticipation now of what, quote, will be later. What is the past? It's our recollections of what now we recollect what was. But do you ever find yourself moving into that future experientially? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, but again, I don't extrapolate some metaphysical story out of that that I cling to. It's rather that just from the point of view of our experience, here we are. There's consciousness and its content. And um, we're just trying to navigate our way through this territory um, clumsily, typically. Well, it's the idea, isn't it? Wherever you are, there you are. Um, yeah. And of course, I think the point you were making there is something that I think many of us think <clears throat> is the idea that what exactly is existence? You know, the past has already gone, has become a memory. And the future right. is an anticipation based upon the memories. And they're all that it is, is that nexus point between what has been and what is about to be which is yeah. this point of, of consciousness and awareness. Um, and, you know, and that's moving through time at all times. But of course, it's our attention onto that. And of course, you know, many philosophers have argued for many years, you know, it's the our, our attention 
to external stimuli that is is important and there's a feedback mechanism taking place there and you reminded me there quite in interestingly it's, it's going to be a very short aside but one of the most curious things that ever happened to me and you might find this quite interesting was that um around about 12 years ago now um i received a very very curious um uh email from somebody in Serpentine in Western Australia. And it was a family living in Serpentine in Western Australia, north of Perth. And they said something very peculiar happened this afternoon. And we were sitting down for our Sunday lunch and there was a knock on the front door. And they went to the front door and standing in front of them was a Buddhist monk in full Buddhist regalia. And the Buddhist monk had a piece of paper in his hand. And he said, on this piece of paper is an email address. Can you please contact this gentleman in the UK? Um, and ask him for his address and I'll come back next week from my monastery and I will pick up the, the, his address and I'll write to him. And this is what they did. They contacted me and they said, and they discovered that apparently there is uh, north of Serpentine, there's the Bodahinya Monastery, which is a monastery of the, uh, the Thai forest tradition, which is apparently very, very austere. Um, yeah. rather similar to the, what you were describing there, you know. And anyway, I, I then, I, I sent my address and then about two weeks later, I receive a letter from um, a, a, the Buddhist monk. Um, and he said that he had come across my work through the most curious set of circumstances, whereby they were moving, they were moving from hut to hut in the monastery. And he went into a hut that hadn't been lived in for a period of time. And in the centre of the room was a table. And in the, under the table was a wonky leg. And somebody had folded a piece of paper or a group of documents to hold the table straight. And he picked up the document. And it was it was my academic paper that I did for the, uh, the Institute for um, uh, Near-Death Studies uh, that Bruce Grayson asked me to write. And it was just sitting there on the floor of this monastery in Western Australia. And he picked it up and he read it and he thought it was extraordinary. And he said, you've actually done a lot of the science of Buddhism and I needed to contact you on this. And subsequently we met, he came over to the UK and there's a, there's a, a monastery in the Midlands in the UK, uh, which is also of this tradition. And apparently what had happened was um, an Australian friend of mine, a consultant psychiatrist had sent the paper to an old Cambridge friend of his, who is a, was a professor of physics at Cambridge, who now runs the monastery. He's quite famous, this guy. And he sent this paper to, my paper to him. Now, self-evidently, this guy wasn't very impressed with the paper because it ended up holding a table leg up. So I guess it wasn't that impressive, but it was really fascinating. And funnily enough, the guy in question um, is from California. He's an American and he used to be a roadie with the Grateful Dead. <laughs> and he ended up being in a monastery, which is extraordinary. So that really intrigued me as to how life really works. But you touched upon there an area that we really need to move on to now is your interest in your questions about life after death. This clearly is something that has interested you for a long time. So what stimulated that? I know it's obvious it's the biggest question ever, but you very much take a very different approach to this. So how did you get interested in the questions and how did you develop it? Um, I was seven years old, actually, is uh, where it begins. Uh, uh, I started asking questions about life after death and the nature of reality when I was a kid. Uh, so I'll, I'll share this experience. Uh, so at the time, my parents were living in this wonderful two-story house. And one night, I just had this compulsion to get out of bed and walk around the corner uh, and stare down the staircase into the foyer in the living room, my parents' house and just stare into the murk, right? The, the room was illuminated a bit through street light coming through the curtains. And I just, uh, the first time I did it, I mean, I did it many times thereafter for reasons that should become apparent in the moment, I, first time I did it, I walked out there and I sat down in the darkness and stared into the living room. And it must have been several minutes went by and it then seemed to me there were people seated on the furniture, on the couch, the chairs, a bit like the party scenes my, my parents would often have. You know, it was the 70s, right? Uh, 
and uh, parents had a lot of parties, at least mine did. Uh, so, but then I noticed something about them. They all had something in common. They were all uh, friends and family members uh, who were dead. Wow. So, you, you know, uh, so I guess I could say I saw dead people uh, and I'm speaking somewhat comedically there. Uh, I don't want, now someone's gonna take that out of context and say, oh, mm. see, he actually, mm. I, I'm not saying they were actually dead people. Um, that's not what is so fascinating to me about it. What's fascinating to me about the experience is that number one, I wasn't afraid. I actually felt um, comforted by the presence, right, that was there. And it got me to ask important questions. That's why I think this is such an important experience. Um, are there things that are real that we normally don't see or that we can only see under certain circumstances? Uh, obviously as a seven-year-old, I'm just like, are they there when the lights are on? Because I would turn on the light and then I wouldn't see them, right? So I started kind of experimenting, you know, and like, like I'd edge down the stairs and like at what point would they disappear? So I'm, I'm a seven-year-old walking around my parents' house in the middle of the night uh, looking for ghosts. Uh, you know, uh, that's how it started. Uh, now, throughout my life, I've had very unusual experiences. Uh, I, they would be classified as ostensibly paranormal experiences. Uh, I lived in a haunted house uh, in Connecticut uh, for a couple of years. When I was a teenager, um, I messed around with, you know, the occult and seances. So I've always been kind of fascinated by unusual things. Uh, and, and of course, it was the house that I lived in that kind of resurrected, uh, no pun intended, resurrected a lot of these interests later in life. And uh, at that point, I started looking into what philosophers and parapsychologists had been exploring uh, since the founding of the societies of psychical research. Uh, and so that goes, that would be around uh, 2002. Right? Uh, and I, I was, I was aware of the research very generally prior to that. Uh, I had taught John Hicks book, death and eternal life. Wonderful book. Yes. It is, it's one of my favorites. Uh, but I, I, I delved into, uh, the research uh, looking at the data and the arguments uh, pretty thoroughly beginning really around 2004 and shortly thereafter I uh, connected with Stephen Browdy uh, and other philosophers. And Can I just go back here very quickly because I know there are people who will be watching this in due course that will be fascinated by your experience as a seven-year-old. Did How long did the experiences of seeing the 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 ghosts the beings or whatever we want to call them the hallucinations how long did that last for and when when did it when did it stop uh yeah it's hard to say i mean uh the i have obviously a very vivid memory of having multiple experiences of that sort you know maybe a month or or so mm. uh, I, I don't think my my memory of how long it lasted is all that reliable um, I just have that vivid recollection of, of having that happen on multiple occasions over a period of time. Uh, yeah, so... The reason I ask that is that um, in my last book, the, the Hidden Universe, I'm particularly interested in um, what I would call, um, well, it's not what I call, Charles Bonnet syndrome in young children, which is misinterpreted as being mythical friends or invisi kids, as they're, they're generally called. Yeah. And it seems to me that there seems to be some kind of neurological correlate taking place here, that children seem to lose this ability to see whatever this is. And could it be to do with the myelination of the neurons? There are, there are various options here, but it's very intriguing. And I draw parallels between this and Pekindarian experiences at the end of life, you know, where people have got Alzheimer's and and, and um, various other neurological conditions. And it seems that the, the ability to attune into a, a greater, you know, again, something else, the wider field, for want of a better term, seems to take place. Yeah. Um, and uh, there is a mutual friend of Sarah and I's who's writing a book at the moment on this very 
issue, which I'm sure she'd be quite fascinated in, in hearing about this. Sorry for jumping in, but I just thought it was quite important to just mention that. So pray continue. Well, I was just going to say that it there, there's a wider context of, of those experiences, namely that uh, my grandmother uh, on, on my uh, father's side, she she had a lot of interest in in the paranormal, um, in, in different religions. She had a very uh, eclectic bookshelf of uh, uh, reading materials, uh, and she would talk about these things all the time. Uh, and and uh, I'm fairly sure it was before I had had that experience, and certainly after. And there were other family members that would talk about having apparitional experiences. So this wasn't something that you know I hadn't heard about in some way. Uh, but when you when you have like the experience yourself, mm -hmm. you know, as as a kid, you're like, hey, I want to kind of explore this and what's going on here. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, I was living in the house in in Connecticut that was sort of the catalyst for my returning to this interest that I had had at various times earlier in my life. Yeah, and so that set me on this, you know, trajectory, which, you know, um, has ultimately resulted in the publications and so forth in my uh, career. Uh, I, prior to my book, which came out in 2016, I had been teaching uh, life after death in various classes for about 10 years. So it was actually, it was a great experience to be able to teach this material that I'm also researching. Mm. Yeah, you, know, you, learn, you learn a lot of things from students who, mm. I mean, obviously I had a lot of students <laughs> coming to me, sharing experiences of various sorts, uh, but this also challenges in different ways and, you know, opening up different angles to how we can explore these phenomena as well as uh, how we reason about them. Right. Uh, and, th and that included a lot of graduate students, too. So that, that was a great time. Uh, and, and, and it did influence a lot of sort of um, how ultimately I ended up making certain kinds of arguments were, you know, informed by the teaching of the topic for some time. Well, of course, I mean, you mentioned John Hick, you know, and his replication yeah. theory. And yeah. um, I, I feature that in my forthcoming book. Uh, together with the work of Eric Steinhardt as well. And it's a very interesting idea, isn't it? The the ideas of John Hick. I, I, if you want to just maybe touch upon them slightly so that um, everybody understands where the philosophical aspects of this come in. Because Hick was a fascinating man. He had a rather similar journey to yourself, didn't he? He started off yeah, as a very yeah. fundamentalist Christian and then by the yeah, end yeah. of his life was very eclectic in his thinking. Yeah. And wasn't he, as I understand it, on at least two or three occasions, he was hauled in front of some group because he was supposed to be a heretic because he was being theoretical in his viewpoints. Is that correct? Uh, I, I, I don't know specifically about that. Uh, I mean, it wouldn't surprise me. Mm. <laughs> uh, I, I should tell you after my conversion to Vaishnavism, I, I don't, that just kind of a, a shorthand way of describing it. But when I was no longer identifying as a Christian, but identifying as a Vaishnav, I got a lot of hate mail, hate mail from Christians. Uh, yeah, some very uh, uh, nasty emails, but um, then again, you know, that's, it's not surprising, I mean, when you think about it, but uh, I wonder if Buddhists yeah. send oh, yeah. hate mail to anyone. Can't imagine many Buddhists sending hate mail out. It'd be interesting no. what religion sends the most hate mail. Yeah, well, what was interesting, Sarah, is the, the more kind of academic uh, Christian friends that I had. I mean, they were far more um, civil uh, uh, and, and, and very accepting, actually, many of them. Uh, so I, that was an interesting pattern, right? That there was um, certain groups which I could almost predict their reaction to it, you know? So that was kind of interesting. But I don't want to give the impression like all Christians somehow came after me that's not true uh, only about 53 percent of them something like that <laughs> which is fine you know i mean it's all part of it uh yeah so hick uh yeah by the way i think john hick is one western thinker who really did have a good grasp of eastern 
philosophy and spirituality. Uh, but again, I mean, he also had the experiential and uh, very uh, practical connection to these traditions, which I think enhanced his understanding. But that book, Death and Eternal Life, uh, it's a fantastic book, not only for its uh, demonstrating John Hick's grasp of uh, the Vedic traditions and, and Buddhism, but also his ability to synthesize those Eastern traditions with uh, Western ideas of life after death, what Western uh, eschatology, right? The teaching of last things. I think it's an amazing book. I also appreciate how he incorporates uh, parapsychology in the discussion. Uh, and also, you know, Hick relies uh, a lot actually on the work of H.H. H. Price. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, uh, you know, I've I've been a big fan of, of Price from the very beginning. You led me to Price. You sent a message to me about H.H. H. Price and I checked him up and I wish I'd read more about him before I'd finished my last book because I could have incorporated his ideas as well. But yes, please go. Yeah, yeah. A, a very wonderful um, thinker, H.H. Uh, H. Price, in conceptualizing, well, really different ways of, of conceiving of, of life after death. And, uh, and Hick incorporates a lot of that into his own um, discussion. So yeah, that, that I think one of the strengths of, of Hick's work is, um, is, is that synthesis as far as life after death goes. But there's another aspect to it in, in envisioning the difference between uh, an ultimate afterlife versus uh, you might call a penultimate. <laughs> Yeah, because that's the central issue, isn't it? You know, within religious tradition, within the Christian tradition, you know, there is the re the bodily resurrection and there's the, the gap between physical death in time and then the yeah. resurrection of the body, which is what Hick was really fascinated in, wasn't he? You know, what are you doing in all that time between yeah. your physical death in time and the resurrection of the body and the final judgment, isn't it? Yeah. And if you look at the Eastern traditions uh, and for instance, the teaching of samsara, of rebirth, uh, you know, for, for a lot of those Eastern traditions, uh, that cycle ultimately terminates, right? It's dissolved. In, in fact, that cycle is an indication that you still have attachments. You're still suffering. I mean, it's not a great, it's not a good thing, right? I mean, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, so you do have rebirth, uh, understood differently across these traditions, but the general idea of the continuation of, of some aspect of what you call your uh, individual consciousness at the moment, uh, continuing after bodily death, but it's not, it's not the whole story, right? There's the, in the non-dual traditions, the eventual dissolution of that stream of uh, individual consciousness. Uh, the river, as the Upanishads say, the, the river, right, eventually empties into the ocean, is this idea. Uh, so Hick, you know, Hick uh, really incorporated a lot of this in his effort to synthesize what Eastern traditions and the Western traditions, specifically Christianity, you know, were saying about the afterlife. And, you know, I've been a big fan most of my academic career of the idea of synthesis, uh, not just for its own sake, but it can give you important insights uh, about the plausibility of um, what, what seem to be on the face of it incompatible viewpoints. Uh, and that's something, curiously enough, I first learned in the study of medieval philosophy in the West. Um, the, the old motto that many of the scholastics had, wherever there's a contradiction, make a distinction. Mm. It's a useful exercise. Hmm. Yes, I like that. So where does, in terms of the philosophy debate, um, let's discuss for a, a little bit of time now, um, the, the concept of how philosophy can be used and philosophers can be involved in this debate, you know, because there's, we can discuss the science, and, but, you know, we, yeah, we yeah. have this borderline then into metaphysics. So where, how do they contribute to the dialogue in general? Right. So let's kind of narrow the discussion of life after death or the survival debate to 
uh, that question as it relates to uh, a certain range of phenomena, right, which you and I are both interested in. We've written on uh, mediumistic communications, near death and out of body experiences in cases of the reincarnation type, uh, what, what are often referred to as paranormal phenomena. Uh, right, so let's talk about that debate which seems very much grounded in observational data and extrapolations from that. Uh, so, right, philosophers uh, typically say, hey, we're not really interested in facts, we're interested in concepts and doing conceptual analysis. Uh, yeah, generally, that, that, that's correct. Uh, but let's, you know, consider how important the conceptual questions are. Let, let's take a question that survivalists uh, frequently raise with reference to any kind of, uh, of these phenomena that I just mentioned. Uh, are, are these uh, facts good evidence for life after death? Okay. I mean, that's a question that people who believe in life after death raise that question. Those who don't believe in life after death, many of them think that's a very significant question. They just may have a different answer to it, right? Uh, that question, in order to properly engage it, really does require that you ask three other questions, right? Uh, what are the facts, right? What is good evidence? And what is life after death? Uh, now, the first question is a factual one. Uh, the other two are conceptual. The question of good evidence uh, is obviously a question that philosophers address in uh, different subdomains of philosophy. It's a question in part of logic, both deductive and inductive logic. Uh, it's also a question of epistemology, the theory of knowledge and related concepts, such as rationality and justification and warrant. Uh, also formal epistemology, which, which deals with uh, confirmation theory and very important philosophy of science. So that question of good evidence is the kind of question that philosophers have spent a lot of time talking about. The question of life after death, what do we mean by that? That's a conceptual question too. We just mentioned H.H. H. Price earlier, right? So he's a philosopher that spent a lot of time thinking about that question what are different ways we can conceive uh, of life after death that is internally coherent and that uh, has a certain relationship to say what we might know about um, consciousness and uh, its relationship to brain functioning. So you get into questions about philosophy of mind, personal identity. These are all uh, conceptual questions, even though they can connect in interesting ways to factual questions. Uh, so what do philosophers offer? Uh, well, they are essential, I would argue, for navigating the conceptual territory that is connected to the question about whether there's good evidence for life after death. Uh, you know, I, I know there are some survivalists who portray themselves as empirically minded scientists who eschew the philosophical uh, questions, but that seems wrong-headed to me. I mean, it seems self-defeating because how can you possibly answer that question? Is there good evidence for life after death if you're ignoring uh, the very robust conceptual dimension to that question, right? Your yeah. thinking is inevitably going to be very naive and may fall victim to simply being uh, what William James referred to as a clever rearranging of your own prejudice. Uh, now, you know, philosophers often say they're not really interested in getting the right answer to something. Uh, and philosophers are often criticized, right, for, uh, you know, you don't really give us any uh, answers. Uh, right, but the way, the way I think of what I do, and many of my colleagues who are philosophers would say, Look, our main interest isn't getting the right answer. Um, it is scrutinizing the answers that we think are right. 
right? And, mm, and like that. sometimes yeah. what you realize is that your answer is the wrong answer, or you've got the right answer to the wrong question, right? So these are important <laughs> ways in which we scrutinize our perspective of the world. Uh, and by the way, that's, that's why you have philosophy of science, philosophy of biology in particular, you have philosophy of religion, philosophy of law. I mean, philosophy itself, I would argue, really isn't a discipline, right? It's a set of techniques that apply to all disciplines when we ask very basic questions about what the hell we're doing in those domains of inquiry. Uh, and so we are curious about how we're reasoning about things. And that's another way just to summarize in a maybe a more concise way. We have the facts and we have the inferences from the facts. What philosophers are looking at would be the business of the inferences from the facts and the deep assumptions that guide those inferences from the facts to the conclusions that we're proposing. Uh, now, I think philosophy also has something to offer when we're exploring the facts, that, that's another question. So I think even when we say we have a factual question, we are concerned about whether our methods are properly tracking truth, right? So even in our investigation of the facts, in our description of the facts, I think there's a lot of uh, conceptual maneuvering there uh, related to the assumptions we're making at that point in the inquiry. So I think philosophy is unavoidable. Uh, I think the only question is whether we're doing it well or badly. Mm. And what's your opinion then? I know that you've come into a fair degree of criticism about your arguments. And I know from reading particularly your book reviews, I mean, I read your book review on the, on the Chris Carter book, for instance, today, and your arguments are very well put together. You know, it, it's quite astonishing how you marshal your facts and how you marshal the use of logic mm -hmm. and applying logic to how we evaluate the facts and as to whether they are facts or not. And I know that, as we've discussed in the past, you know, that there has been a degree of criticism on your for your approach, because I know, for instance, and it's something we, we need to touch in on, uh, which is of great importance, is the idea of either, you know, super, super psi is involved here in some way, and there's very other ways in terms of mediums, mediums and things. But how have they approached it? How have your critics got, got it wrong? Because I know that your, your argument is extremely subtle, and I don't I think people miss the subtlety of it. Yeah, uh, sure. My arguments in, in my book and even in my um, articles. Uh, yeah, I think uh, a lot of critics have missed what I'm arguing. Uh, and I've tried to spend a lot of time helping them through this. Uh, sadly, to uh, no avail, actually. Uh, so let's just talk about some of these. So uh, some of my critics are convinced that I hold the view and that I'm arguing, or at least it's an implication of my arguments, that there can be no good argument for life after death. Uh, no, I don't hold that view, and it's not an implication of anything that I have published, uh, and whether in my blog or in you know peer-reviewed uh, publications. So uh, I did ask one of my critics, uh, Jim Matlock, um, like we had a lengthy discussion around the time of the publication of my book, and he said that he thinks that's what I'm arguing. And I said, well, okay, Jim, I'm not arguing that. So please stop saying I'm arguing that. Uh, I said, but tell me, uh, can you point to like a passage in my book where I said that or implied that in your view? And uh, he said, well, it's just kind of the impression that I got. I said, okay, I understand that. Can you point to the passage that gave you that impression? And he said, I'll get back to you. Um, Jim, I'm still waiting for you to get back to me on this particular issue. Uh, it's been now many years um, since you were going to get back to me. Oh, it was uh, only a couple of days ago. I, I read your review of um, Jim's book, by the way, which I thought was excellent, just as an aside. Really enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Jim didn't enjoy it. <laughs> I, I'm not surprised. Uh, uh, I'm not surprised. I mean, you yeah. you, uh, you mentioned the work. I mean, this is again another aside, but uh, Keith Augustine, 
um, and a lot of his work. And I've been a huge admirer of his work ever ever since he did a paper on the near death experience in the uh, the uh, Ian's journal, which I thought was a very well put through logical piece of work. Again, yeah. that's just as an aside. I was just diving yeah. in there as I do. Yeah. Well, and I did. I did point out that uh, uh, Jim Matlock uh, didn't fairly present um, Keith's uh, arguments. And Keith and I have talked about that uh, at length um, over the last year and a half or so. Uh, and, and Jim doesn't present my views either. In Signs of Reincarnation, uh, he doesn't accurately present my, my views. He, he doesn't even present my arguments. He just extraps, extrapolates uh, or extracts claims from what I've argued and deploys them for a purpose that they weren't intended for. Uh, but if we kind of go back, you know, so saddling me with a viewpoint that I don't hold appears in a variety of different um, versions. The other one that's a fairly common one is that, that uh, I supposedly think or have argued that the appeal to living agent psychic functioning is at least an equally good explanation of the evidence, um, you know, or the data, whether it's from mediumistic communications or. You, can you can you explain to the the, the watchers, the listeners, or what for want for better yeah. exactly what you mean by that? Because that's quite a subtle yeah. point you're making there. Yeah. Uh, so one of the alternative explanations. Uh, to life after death in order, say, to account for the data from mediumistic sittings where um, there appear to be communications coming from uh, deceased persons uh, or discarnates, if you will. One of the alternative explanations, other than, you know, Uncle Harry has actually survived death, is that the medium's ability to know certain facts about Uncle Harry is the result of psychic functioning, uh, some combination, let's say, of uh, telepathy with the sitter or clairvoyance, um, possibly uh, retrocognition. There are a whole range of ostensible displays uh, or modalities, we might say, of um, psychic functioning in living persons. And uh, Stephen Browdy, for example, has, I think, one of the best discussions of this, you know, in, in many of his publications. Uh, he's explored that exotic counter explanation uh, for, for many years. Uh, so that that's one of the alternatives. And then the question is, well, how good of a counter explanation is that? Well, it was one of the points you made, wasn't it, where you, you, you said that, and it's a very important point you make, that if great uncle Bert is a disincarnate spirit that's communicating with me here. And great uncle Bert says that you are very worried about um, something that's going to occur in your life. That suggests that great uncle Bert has a skill that he didn't have in normal life, which is understanding the contents of my thoughts. Yeah. And I think that's such a valid point because that happens so often, doesn't it? You know, where it seems that, it's, it's almost a form of telepathy taking place between me and whatever the disincarnate spirit or the medium who is giving me the information. And surely applying Occam's razor suggests that it's the medium themselves subliminally picking up the information in my in some form of telepathy or mind reading that's regurgitating the information back to me because that's what it the person, the medium believes I want to hear. Right. And, and of course, that's one of the long standing um, points, right, in the literature is that even on the on the survival hypothesis, um, the survivalist will need to um, attribute uh, to the discarnate personality and uh, possibly also the medium uh, psychic functioning. And so the question is, does that require a greater degree or greater refinement, uh, you know, than the living agent, the notion that it's just the medium uh, psychically uh, connecting with the appropriate facts, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. Uh, so where, where my reasoning comes into the picture here is, I mean, I cover these issues, not, not only in my book, but uh, in, in other publications. And 
so I, I don't take the view that the appeal to living agent psychic functioning is at least as good of an explanation. The argument I make is that survivalists historically have not been able to rule out that counter explanation for reasons that are really central to my book. Uh, mm -hmm. And it has to do with, we might say, the, the internal coherence of the survivalist arguments. Uh, so it, maybe we can talk a bit more about that. Please, but, yeah, no, this is interesting. I just, wanna under, I just wanna underscore this point that there's a big difference between saying survivalists have failed to rule out that explanation as equally good versus saying, I actually think that it is equally good. Uh, another way of putting this is given the assumptions that survivalists uh, are operating with, they can't, or at least haven't, right, ruled out those explanations. Uh, so, yeah, in my book, I'm looking at the kinds of arguments survivalists have made historically, right? And uh, looking at, for example, the kinds of reasons they frequently invoke in order to rule out that counter explanation. For example, think about some of these reasons. Well, it would require a degree of psychic functioning among living persons for which there's no independent evidence. Yeah, maybe let's just grant that. Um, it would also involve, you know, psychic functioning that would be very, very complex, all right? Uh, and it's, that's a problem, right? And then and there's a whole list of other concerns. And survivalists have appealed to these to try to rule out that counter explanation. The, the, the problem uh, is that if you unpack the survival hypothesis in a way that is going to give it explanatory efficacy, then you're going to have to rely on a variety of assumptions that fall into that same trap. Yes. Right? And it's, so it's the role of auxiliary assumptions that complicate what the survivalist is trying to do. Uh, so in other words, the, the argument there, let's assume we're just talking about what's the best explanation for the data. The survivalist needs to argue that survival explains the data and that the alternative explanations uh, do not provide uh, plausibly, do not provide a, at least an equally good explanation. Now, survivalists have spent a lot of time arguing the latter point, that the counter explanations don't work. They haven't spent nearly as much time, so I argue, in showing that the survival explanation does account for the data. Uh, if they spend more time on working out, as it were, the logic of that, they're going to run up immediately to a fairly basic point in explanatory reasoning that you must be deploying a whole range of additional assumptions in addition to consciousness is persisting after death, or my individual consciousness is persisting after death. Look, they have to make assumptions about um, what consciousness will be like when it survives death, um, the degree of psychological continuity that it's going to have with our present existence, and really not even our own present existence. They have to identify robust continuity with only one of many states of consciousness that we experience in this life. Notice it's never our dream world experience that is continuing on, that state of consciousness. You know, uh, what do you do with dissociative phenomena, right? I mean, C.D. Broad brought this up. So let, let's just acknowledge already that consciousness in our present experience um, is, is multiple, and, you know, and so you've got to make certain assumptions about continuity, uh, of consciousness, uh, the psychological content, right? And, and a variety of other assumptions, like, like you were indicating, we have to also assume for many of the kinds of evidence that there is fairly robust psychic functioning that's continuing. 
right? Or that is emerging if it's not present in this life. So there, there's just a lot of entanglement and assumptions and survivalists mask this dependence on assumptions first by throwing all their focus on the kinds of assumptions that the alternative explanations have to you know, take on board and then show why those aren't all that plausible. The challenge is to simultaneously show that you can rule out those counter explanations on the grounds of adopting implausible assumptions, whilst at the same time showing that you're not guilty of the same thing in your effort to show that survival explains. But again, that point is masked, so I argue, by treating the survival hypothesis in a fairly superficial way, which yes, it appeals to some people's intuitions and maybe their default thinking, uh, but to that extent, the reasoning is very sort of impressionistic and doesn't mm. dig deep enough into what you must be assuming in these arguments uh, to make your case. Interesting, so interestingly enough, Michael, about. one of the things that I did in my introductory section to my, my um, Bigelow essay um, that was rejected um, was exactly the point you're making there. You know, it, when we talk about life after death, what are we actually talking about? What, 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 how are we defining it? What is, what is the nature of the survival? Is it consciousness that survives? And as you rightly say, you know, we have um, the fractalization of personality. You know, we are never the same personality throughout life. And yet it seems to be that the moment after death, suddenly we are almost stuck in aspic and we become this entity that lives forever or, or whatever we believe it to be and i think your questions here are of profound importance but i can very much see your point here you're not all you're doing is you're acting you're you're putting the same rules to be applied to the survivalist position yeah. philosophically which is what yeah. you need to do it's what we need to do because ultimately there are skeptics out there that will have a heyday if there's no rational and no logical thought being put into it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so you can take the analogy, you know, we're sitting down and playing a game of chess. Well, the same rules apply, mm. right? And the other person, right? Um, and then it's only a question of, you know, how we're, you know, leveraging the rules and the skill of making our moves. And my argument is that survivalists in some cases aren't following the same rules um, that they're imposing on their critics. And, and where they are giving some allegiance to the rules, they're not very skillful in how they're making their moves. Mm. Um, and this leads to a, a kind of a deceptive appearance of accomplishing something that they're actually not. You know, I think this issue of, you know, the connection between um, our consciousness in this life, the anti-mortem consciousness and what we're postulating for you know, an afterlife, I think it's a really important question. And I mean, C.D. Broad explored this, you know, early, you know, in in, in the twentieth century, and you know, pointed out uh, he was looking at more sort of extreme variations in our states of consciousness in this life, looking at the dream state versus our waking state, looking at uh, cases of an abnormal psychology of dissociative identity disorder formerly known as multiple personality. But it's very clear uh, in, in the contemporary perspective that a lot of the older views about the self that were once popular in Western psychology uh, you know, are not nearly as plausible as they used to be, and in fact, outright rejected. Um, for example, the notion that the, the degree of unity to the self that was previously assumed, uh, I think is very much in doubt, uh, I tend to favor the view that we're really a, a series of self states that are more or less um, tightly bound together. And, you know, it doesn't take much in experience to kind of fray that. Mm. And of course, that's the stuff of personality disorders and a variety of other um, uh, states of you know, being psychologically destabled, uh, destabilized. So we understand how fragile what we call the self is. So it is an important question. It's like, what's gonna continue afterwards? Now, in one sense, 
I, I don't think that we have a substantial self to begin with. And there is a stream of consciousness, um, or as I just said, a series of self states. Uh, there are patterns that are there. The pattern can continue, but uh, clearly in this life, I don't think we have the kind of um, substantial self that some survivalists think that, that we have. I don't think it's necessary to argue in these survival arguments that it's the self that's continuing, but um, rather than to say a stream of consciousness that has a certain pattern of information. Well, you, you can make, you, you you can make the argument that way, right? But, uh, but I guess the thing I wanted to say about that is when I look at like the discarnates that are ostensibly communicating through mediums, uh, that's just one kind of category of ostensible evidence for life after death. They, they, it, it, they seem almost kind of like a cartoonish version of, of our present existence. Uh, and they, they, they look a lot like what I would imagine people think of as the continuation of a self, even if there is no such thing, right? So it's more of a projection of how we think about the self and therefore how we would think about the self continuing after death. Uh, now, again, that's just a, a kind of a limited criticism uh, of that kind of interpretation, right? Of the sittings and mediumship. But I, th I think it also applies like, to certain near death experiences that we, the end, you know, when, when we're talking about that, it seems to depend on a kind of assumption about what we are that I don't think is quite right to begin with. Mm. Uh, and we're just projecting that out into a future state. And by the way, that's the history of views of the afterlife, right, in the religious traditions of the world is, is arguably in part that these are idealized versions of our understanding of this life. Yes, I mean, it, one of the points you made that I thought that was very pertinent, one thing that leapt to my mind was, you know, about the dreaming state in, in after post-mortem survival, you know, do people have out-of-body experiences in the near-death state, in, in afterlife, you know, do they dream in afterlife, do they need to sleep? But also, more importantly, I think your point about disassociative personality syndrome is a very important one, because, I, you know, in one of my earlier books, I, I spent a lot of time talking to people who work with people who have disassociative personality syndrome and they told me on many occasions that what would happen is that the 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 alter personality would be the one that would survive the bringing together of the personality so in fact the initial personality dies in effect and is replaced by an alter personality that wasn't in existence at the start so there we have some very interesting areas here you know of, of what as you say what does survive now, of course, we, we're really onto some very interesting areas of discussion here, and I'm aware of time, and I'm very keen for us to move on to, in terms of a classic example of um, evidence supposedly of reincarnation um, that has been cited by a number of the essays in the BICS competition. And I know you have a very interesting angle on this, and we're talking here about the Leninger case and the reincarnation story. Um, and I'm very keen for you to tell us a little bit about your interpretation of this and how your, your interpretation differs from the interpretation that's been made by many of the people who were successful prize winners within the, the, the Bix competition. Yeah, so after I published my book in, uh, on Life After Death in 2016, uh, I was interested in sort of stepping back and you know looking at a particular case uh, in with incredible detail and actually looking at the factual tier, right, rather than the conceptual stuff, uh, throw the focus on the facts and begin looking at whether, you know, the presumed facts are actual facts. Because uh, I just assumed that in my book, allowing survivalists to sort of, I'm granting them the kinds of facts that they claim are essential to the argument. So. Let's step back and now look at the facts. So uh, I, you know, I decided on the James Leininger case uh, in part because Stephen Browdy had recommended that I look at it. 
uh, Steve and I had had a number of conversations and he said, well, you know, based on Tucker, Jim Tucker's investigation of the case uh, in Return to Life, which was published in 2013, seems like it's a pretty good case. That would be a good one to look at. And um, so the, the James Leininger story as a case of ostensible reincarnation was one of a few uh, cases that I was looking at, but that was the one that I really focused on. And uh, I did not know that I would spend two years of my life researching this case, all right? I had no idea I would do that. Uh, I, I read Jim Tucker's publications on it and I uh, had a number of questions. Uh, Jim Tucker and I had had previous correspondence while I was writing my book. So I, you know, I hit him up with some questions and he answered them. I did ask him if he um, could share a more detailed chronology of events because that seemed to me to be a really crucial part of, of, of this case. And I really, it's an important part of all such cases as we know from reading Ian Stevenson. Uh, for various reasons, um, Jim wasn't able to share his chronology with me, which was good. And I told him recently that that was actually one of the best things that could have happened to me because it forced me to uh, build my own chronology uh, based on what? Well, I read the Leininger's book uh, once, twice, three times, four times. I don't know how many times I've gone through that book at this point. And I developed a chronology of events based on the book that Bruce and Andrew Leininger uh, wrote, uh, laying out their story about their son allegedly being the reincarnation of a World War II fighter pilot, James M. Houston Jr. Uh, so I developed that chronology. Uh, I then viewed every interview uh, I could find uh, with the Leinigers and developed chronologies from their interviews. Uh, and, and there was a lot out there to cover. And in the course of my research, uh, I connected with someone that was fairly close to the, the Leininger story early on um, and, and received a chronology that Bruce Leininger had put together in 2003, which is very early, right, um, in this case. Uh, and I looked at that chronology. I brought all these together. I looked at Jim Tucker's chronologies as well. And imagine each one of these chronologies as a kind of transparency, and then you overlay them right on top of each other. And uh, they didn't connect in, in crucial ways. These were different chronologies. They were logically inconsistent with respect to crucial parts of the case, meaning things that the boy's parents attributed to him at certain times. Um, were way off, they were different, they changed over time. That was the other thing I noticed, that there were redactions and that many of these redactions, fr quite frankly, I would argue all of them, were made in the light of facts that the Leiningers later learned about the assumed previous personality. Mm -hmm. It's a highly suspicious thing, whether it's intentional on their part is a separate question. I think it's very easy for this to be uh, something that individuals are not conscious of. And Ian Stevenson, by the way, was quite concerned about this way in which evidence can become contaminated by what individuals learn in the process of trying to verify claims of a subject. Good point. A good point. Yes. And, and, and by the way, that's why Stevenson, one of the reasons why he emphasized the importance of multiple witnesses that are independent testifying to what the child subject said and did at various times and also why he emphasized that your strongest cases will be cases where uh, the claims and behaviors attributed to the subject are documented before anyone has attempted to verify those claims. And in the James Leininger case, uh, the boy's father, Bruce, engaged in attempts at verification very early in this case, within just a few months. Uh, and it continued, right? As the boy continues to evolve claims and behaviors, well, um, it is concurrent with an ongoing investigation by his father. Um, and I think it does influence the case in a variety of ways that undermines the evidential value of the case. But one of the most important discoveries was the extent 
to which uh, the boy was exposed to a variety of ordinary sources of information that contained the ingredients of the things that his parents attributed to him and claimed were inexplicable. Um, for those who are not familiar with, with this story, I, I would think most people are at this point because it has received such attention over the last nearly two decades. Uh, it begins with the boy having nightmares of being trapped in a burning plane. Um, and he's uh, had just turned two years old. He begins having these nightmares. He's waking up, um, airplane crash, big fire, little man can't get out. So, and he, he's obviously having um, nightmares of, of, of a rather uh, extreme sort. Uh, and as he becomes more verbal, he in the following months, he starts describing the elements of this dream that convey World War II imagery, right? He refers to a Corsair plane, which is a very distinctive World War II uh, fighter plane. He talks about being shot down by the Japanese. And when his parents ask, how do you know it's the Japanese? He says, oh, the big red sun. Right, the, the Japanese symbol found on their flat on the Japanese battle flag and also on their airplanes. So he's giving World War II uh, themes, right? Uh, and, and this continues, right? Uh, for several months, where we have kind of the scaffolding of this case uh, coming into place, uh, culminating um, in this early phase over the last first eight months or so with the boy claiming when his father opens a book on World War II, uh, uh, Battle of Iwo Jima specifically, there's an aerial photograph of Iwo Jima and the boy allegedly points to it and says, that's where my plane crashed, daddy. Uh, so I was curious as to, well, where would he be getting this imagery? Uh, and what prompted me on this was there were certain hints in Jim Tucker's writings and in the Leinigers' uh, accounts of this narrative that, first of all, the boy had watched a Blue Angels aviation video. And he had also gone to a flight museum prior to and also subsequent to the uh, emergence and early evolution of these nightmares. Uh, it seemed to me nobody was paying enough attention. To so just facts. to be quite clear here, the Blue Angels video that the child had seen before and during and after effectively the emergence of the, the personality or want, whatever we want to call it. And it also, so the, the information was there pri that would have been in his mind prior to when he started making the claims effectively. Am I right? Yeah, so let me be very specific. Um, the, Bruce, took, Bruce Leininger took his son to the Kavanaugh Flight Museum in Addison, Texas in February of 2000, right? Um, that they're very clear about this in all the chronologies. Uh, that flight museum has World War II planes and um, artifacts from World War II. We'll come back to this. But at that, at that three hour visit to the museum, uh, the father bought him some toy airplanes and also a Blue Angels aviation video. Uh, now, uh, can you explain what the Blue Angels video is so that for people who will? Yeah, so there's a whole, so the Blue Angels were um, uh, a flight demonstration um, uh, group that was put together uh, after World War II uh, in order to keep public interest in uh, American military and the technology and so forth. A lot of the early pilots had fought in World War II, right? So that's an interesting. It's like the, the English Red Arrows. It's the same kind of. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Very much like that. And uh, so you know, there have been a, there's been a history of videos of the Blue Angels. You know, and they go around the country and even outside the United States and do these flight demonstrations. Very impressive um, flight demonstrations. Uh, so. <clears throat> Uh, Bruce Leininger purchased this video for his son, which uh, we're told the boy watched like kind of 24 seven, right, for over a year. And he was regularly watching this video so much so that it was worn out and the father had to replace it, um, you know, uh, once or twice along the way in that first kind of year, year and a half uh, from what we can gather in the chronology. So, well, what was this video? Because Jim Tucker in his uh, investigation of the case says that 
the boy saw it, uh, Jim, following what the father told Jim Tucker, said the name of the video is It's a Kind of Magic. Uh, well, I wanted to find that video. Now, Jim Tucker in his publications indicates he couldn't find it. No surprise. Uh, there is no video on the Blue Angels by that name. Okay. Uh, I did find the video, and in my publication on this case, um, which is now available on my website and will shortly appear in the online uh, edition of the Journal of Scientific Exploration, I document why we know that the video I identify is the video. And that's partly actually a confirmation from Bruce Leininger himself, eventually. Uh, the, the video is Blue Angels Around the World. Um, it's speed of sound. Uh, it's narrated by Dennis Quaid. And it has as its theme song, the Queen song, It's a Kind of Magic. And uh, I discovered this video. I just started looking at Blue Angels videos. And I think it was the third one I saw on YouTube had that as a theme song. And I knew immediately, okay, this must be it. And subsequently that was confirmed. But uh, I also knew that was the video for another reason. I watched the whole thing. And I was somewhat stunned as to like how much of the content of that video were things that were attributed to James and related to the imagery of his dreams in the early phase of this case. Um, and yet the parents, Bruce and Andrea Leniger, have said repeatedly that there were no images of burning planes, planes on fire, anything he was watching that could have possibly could have possibly influenced these dreams and given him these images. And yet, what do we find in this video? We find an image of a fighter plane being shot down. Um, it's, it's hit, it explodes in the air, it's on fire. It doesn't disintegrate, it's just burning as it begins to nose over and head toward the ground. And then there are scenes of bombs being dropped on land targets. Now, these are brief clips but I want you to imagine being a two-year-old watching this over and over again, right? These are very vivid imagery. imagery. In fact, the, the plane being shot in the archival footage is slowed down, right? So it's very vivid when you see the impact and it bursting into flames. The important thing here, well, there are a few. One is that I think this is pretty obvious a source of the imagery in the dreams. Uh, but the fact that the parents seem to be unaware uh, that that was on the video, even though they have given repeated assurance that the boy was not exposed to any such imagery, I think is a, is a, is a very big problem for their reliability uh, as judges of what kinds of uh, sources of information he was exposed to. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, it's hard to even do justice to the mountain of sources uh, of information that this boy was exposed to in the Kavanaugh Flight Museum is one of the others, right? I spent a lot of time uh, tracking down individuals uh, at the museum, and including someone who worked there uh, the time period that James uh, visited, and was able to reconstruct the contents of the museum, not based solely on the testimony of staff members, right, who also researched stuff for me, if they didn't have the answer, but I picked up the museum guide from the time period in question. I found one copy, right, um, through a used book uh, vendor. I also um, went to use the archive um, Wayback Machine, right, and went and looked at the website over the years for the museum and was able to use that as a source. And what I discovered was that, um, first of all, the museum had, um, most of the imagery and items that the boy exhibited some kind of knowledge about. Uh, the boy could, you know, identify a drop tank, right, for a World War II plane. Yeah, but they have drop tanks in the artifacts hangar. And they also have, uh, there was at least one plane that had a drop tank on it that was on display when he, when he visited. Um, there was a Japanese battle flag on display um, at the entrance to the gallery, which is connected to the gift shop where the boy uh, allegedly spent a lot of time uh, looking at the toys, which of course included a variety of Corsair toy airplanes and models. And keep in mind, he wouldn't have been there all by himself. 
uh, and he went on two occasions and there were other people around. I've often, um, while I've been researching this, went back to experiences I've had with, with my son. I remember he went to a natural history museum. He couldn't read, but he came back and he's talking about the T-Rex and pterodactyls and he's able to point them out. And it's like, dude, where, where did you, you know, he couldn't read, but he heard it from other people, right, that were mm -hmm. at the museum. Kids are very great at soaking up information in ways that elude the awareness of parents, clearly. Well, that's what they're there to do, aren't they? At that age, you know, they're taking yeah, in they everything, do. even if it's- And so also uh, on the first visit, there was a point at which um, Bruce Leiniger, uh, the boy's father, wasn't even with them because he looked down and he couldn't see where his son had disappeared and he found him over looking at the World War II planes again. So, I mean, even, the, even his father can't give a complete, you know, like assurance about, what he was or wasn't exposed to. But the fact that these things are at the museum is important. The fact that there are very stunning artwork displays of Corps airplanes in dogfights, right? In the Pacific, right? Flying over islands that look a lot like Iwo Jima and that image in the book. These are important things, right? To consider that the boy saw these things. There was also a room where there were videos, aviation videos that visitors could view. When I inquired about what these videos were, um, I was told, uh, well, they were um, mostly World War II and Vietnam videos. Wow. So, and again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, the boy was there, the was there another issue as well about the actual location of where um, the the pilot actually crashed was not Iwo Jima, or there was something was about the location? Chichijima, about 200 miles to the north. This is another one of the aspects of the case, which I find very problematic. Uh, if we're trying to like regard this case as evidence for life after death, uh, reincarnation in particular. Uh, prior to the Leinigers publishing their book, the claim they attributed to their son was that he had looked at a picture in that uh, Battle of Iwo Jima book and pointed to the aerial shot of Iwo Jima and said to his father, Daddy, that's where my, that's where my plane crashed. Uh, of course, as the story evolved and the father is trying to confirm the things that his son is claiming, he eventually um, learns that there's this fighter pilot associated with um, the Natoma Bay escort carrier, uh, BC-81 squadron that um, was stationed on that carrier, and that that carrier did support um, operations at Iwo Jima uh, at, at a certain point in um, 1945. And during that time, uh, this alleged previous personality, James Houston Jr., uh, he actually did die, but he didn't die at Iwo Jima. He died in a mission to Chichijima, a bombing run. Um, which, but at this time, that escort carrier was also supporting operations at Iwo Jima. So he didn't die at Iwo Jima. He died at Chichijima. Uh, and I spent a lot of time in my paper exploring just the death. But your point is about the location, because clearly, the boy got that wrong if it's supposed to be referring to James Houston. But surprisingly, um, your viewers can now read in Soul Survivor, the book that the Leinigers wrote, and you will notice that the claim they attribute to their son is not that's where my plane crashed, but that's when my plane crashed. Now, mm -hmm. some have proposed the very natural explanation that the boy misused a word, <laughs> right? That he meant to say, where but he said when and kids misuse words i mean when they're you know two and a half years old it's pretty common but the way this has been leveraged by individuals like the leinigers and jim tucker is to argue well the boy kind of got it right because what he was really saying was that the previous personality died during the battle of iwo jima uh but um I, I see no reason to think that's what he meant, but I'm also curious about like why the change in the story, mm -hmm. right? And that's an important point. So Jim Tucker actually did ask Bruce Leiniger about this when Jim investigated the case in 2010, shortly after they had published their book. And uh, what Jim 
said that Bruce told him was, well, I, I misremembered what James said. Well, that's a pretty big thing to misremember. And it is kind of convenient that it at least moves it out of the category of clearly false to maybe true, maybe false. I don't know, like, what does he mean? That's when my plane crashed. Uh, I, I think that's a problem. I mean, if you're admitting that you forgot such a crucial fact for nearly a decade, because we can see, right, going back to 2002, when the Leinigers first began to tell their story, um, before the previous personality was decided on, that that was the claim, that's where my plane crashed. And it's what they, they said for several years in various interviews in the ABC primetime uh, program in 2004 with Chris Cuomo as the correspondent. That's where my plane crashed. But then when it came to their book, now all of a sudden it was different. And uh, I don't think there's an adequate rationale uh, that doesn't undermine the reliability of the Leinigers in one way or the other. But so here's the thing, Anthony, people are going to hear this and say, yeah, yeah, but it's just like one thing, but sure, but it's not one thing because this kind of redaction happens again and again and again with multiple aspects to the story that some of which are its most important evidential features on the face of it. Um, so I, I think it's just, it's one of like dozens of problems with this case, not to mention uh, the way in which the Leinigers have crafted their description of the circumstances of James Houston's death so that it um, fits a bit better, right, with the things their son claimed, or rather what they claim their son claimed. So see, if you can continue to change what you're attributing to the subject, and then you ignore certain facts in the historical record, it's very easy to create the appearance of a fit that is very extraordinary between uh, the facts of some previous personality and the claims that the subject is now making. And I think that's a serious problem in this case. It's not the only one, but it's, you know, look, the bottom line is in that Bix essay, because, you know, hopefully we have a few more minutes, we can talk about the fact that Bruce Leiniger recycled this story as one of the essays in the Bigelow competition. Not only do other essays refer to this case very favorably, but Bruce Leiniger himself wrote a paper in this competition, was awarded $20,000 for his paper um, that is at least worthy of acknowledgement by the judges as providing the best evidence for life after death. Mm. What is his argument? And he gives a chronology. He claims that uh, the chronology of events, right, in which certain claims and behaviors are attributed to his son he then says, look, these match the facts of this previous personality exactly. He uses that word exactly. Never varied in any respect. And then he claims that the fact of these matches is beyond coincidence. And there's no ordinary explanation in the way of ordinary sources of information that could have possibly, possibly influenced him. And therefore, Bruce concludes that his son is the reincarnation of this previous personality. And that this is a quote proof, not just any proof, he says it has the force of a geometric demonstration. Now, even if I were to grant him his premises, the conclusion does not follow validly. Um, and so that's one problem, but it's not the greatest problem. The biggest problem is that each of those premises is false, all right? So you have false premises, which even if they were true, would not logically entail the conclusion or even make it more probable than not. And this, Anthony, is what the judges regard as the best evidence for life after death. Mm, that's uh, intriguing. Uh, I think it's the textbook definition of the worst possible evidence you could have for anything, <laughs> right? Well, it begs uh, the question, yeah. doesn't it, as to how the facts that were put forward in not just that essay, but other essays, were never actually checked by anybody and had they been aware of your paper that would have rather hopefully colored their opinion or do you think that that wouldn't have been the case i think for some of them it would i've already received um some comments from meetings i've had uh with individuals um one of whom was in the top tier of, of winners uh certainly now stepping back 
from endorsing this case. But I know there are going to be others who will continue to endorse it because it, it seems fairly clear to me that their opinions about the case in the first place weren't formed in an evidentially sensitive way. I will not be surprised, therefore, that uh, they continue with the same opinion. Uh, I expect Jim Tucker, with whom uh, I've had substantial discussion about this case last fall as I was completing my paper, uh, I, 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 I would hope Jim would recalibrate at least his degree of enthusiasm for this case in the light of the facts that I've presented. That said, I will not be surprised if he, you know, um, this will double down on the case. And the reason why I say that is that uh, it, it seems to me that there is in the original discussion of this case, in Jim Tucker's discussion and analysis of it, and that found in others like Carol Bowman, right? Uh, it's not clear from what they write about this case why the facts, the presumed facts, are supposed to be evidence for life after death or reincarnation in particular, much less good evidence. So if you're not clear about why the presumed facts are evidence for reincarnation, it, it'll be very easy for you not to see how the kind of facts I present uh, undermine that. Uh, and this goes to one of my broad concerns about the literature in the field is um, it is just not adequately calibrated to deal with these important questions about the nature of evidence, how we make arguments, uh, and how we have arguments that are robust enough to underwrite the kinds of claims we want to make. So it is a concern of mine uh, that, uh, that individuals will continue to ignore this. Or here's another response I'm sure will come out of this, uh, and we can see how well I predict these things, okay, uh, three months from now. Uh, and Jim will respond, my understanding is to my paper, and I will offer a response to his response uh, to be published, I believe, in the JSC. Uh, well, it's only one case. Okay, that, that, that's, that's going to be uh, one response. That's interesting, um, because before, it wasn't just one case. It was the case. It was a gold standard case. Uh, in fact, even to this day, as of last month, Jim Tucker continues to endorse this case in interviews, right? And going as far as to say, well, if we had like 50 cases like the James Leininger case, that might change people's opinions. Mm -hmm. Well, I think if we have 50 cases like the James Leininger case, the entire project, it, the Division of Perceptual Studies, is um, in, in massive ruin, quite frankly. I just, I, I think that that's the wrong thing to say about this case at this point. Uh, but sure, uh, it used to be right, the case. And I think it will still be the case for a lot of people. Um, but I just don't see how they can, how they can um, retain that viewpoint with any adequate engagement with the evidence. Um, and, and, and I'll add to this, Carol Bowman, who factors in this case in various ways, she counseled the Leiningers uh, in early 2001, the early phase of this case. She wrote the foreword to their book. She lectures on this case frequently. She was responsible for hooking them up with, you know, the uh, uh, television program that never aired, but was filmed in 2002, right? So Carol and I did have a discussion about this case several months ago uh, before Thanksgiving. Um, she thought it was going to be an hour Zoom session. It turned out to be three. I went over this evidence. Um, I, she was stunned. I think that's a fair thing to say. Um, and it appears she went through a period of doubt. <laughs> um, uh, but she did inform me uh, subsequently that she still thinks the case is a good case. It's interesting, this, isn't it? I mean, we're, we're coming to the end now, and it's been an absolutely yeah. fascinating discussion, but I'm immediately reminded of, um, the key, again, Keith Augustine, who we mentioned earlier, and his paper that I read many years ago, where he... He, he, he did a lot of research into various famous uh, NDE cases, including the Harbourview case, 
um, uh, Maria Shu, um, you know, I think is the same case. And I think also the way in which Chinese whispers goes around about the Pam Reynolds case. But all of these, when you start to look into them in the same way as you've done, and I found this in my writing and my research, it's profoundly disappointing because the facts are never quite as they're first presented. But they still continue to cite these cases as being classic examples when they've already been taken apart, you know, in, in so many ways. Now, I'm very aware now of time. So in terms of if anybody wants to read your paper, your website, which I think is extraordinarily interesting. So if you want to let people know how they can contact you, how they can check out your work and any other things that you'd want to say now. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I have a website, uh, Cup of Nirvana. Uh, it's uh, actually michaelsudduth.com, so it should be pretty easy to remember. Um, and I have a blog on that page, um, on that website, and I have been given permission to uh, publish my report on the James Leininger case on that website um, in advance now, just a few days in advance of its appearance on the JSC website. Uh, I will also be publishing a critique of Bruce Leininger's uh, Bigelow submission, uh, which I think, uh, look, Bruce has actually helped my case because he said some things in this paper that quite frankly, uh, yeah, it, he's, he's made the situation a lot worse for himself at this point uh, mm -hmm. by, by the latest iteration. Uh, of the story. And so I have a very detailed critique that I'll be publishing in my blog in the next few days, uh, complete with um, video clips from some of these sources that I've been talking about and photographs. These are, some of these are included in the JSC paper, but uh, I, I provide more. And also, you know, Bruce Leininger in his Bigelow paper um, uh, refers to the appendices of his paper where he provides supporting documentation uh, to this I believe to this day, the uh, paper as it is online at the Bigelow Institute does not have uh, those resources connected to it. I have sent um, emails uh, to the Institute telling them they need to correct this because they need to publish Bruce's paper with his alleged sources. But uh, fear not, um, one of the most important of those is an aircraft action report uh, that deals with the details of James Houston's death um, I've published that on my website. So individuals can see the original documents for themselves, um, uh, which I discuss in detail because um, I, th I think they disconfirm several crucial aspects to uh, the Leininger's narrative. Wow, Michael, that was an extraordinary two hours. Absolutely incredible. It has been wonderful fascinating thanks so for accommodating the time um i feel like i'm just now waking up <laughs> i know <laughs> you're, you're um, on a run. usually i don't um, get going until like 10 o'clock and that's a.m and, and of course start. that's the difficulty it's such an early start for you and that's why yeah. we delayed the start as best we could what i think we will do is we will definitely have you back for a future show i mean because particularly to see how this pans out now um so thank you very much for i would also like to you know in a future episode to kind of get more into detail on inference to best explanation arguments, because I've just sort of very generally talked about that. The, the details are really important and that's something we can take up uh, I, I think this is something that you and I need to take forward. I mean, I'm discussing with a number of my associates now that we need to be starting to become a good deal more rigorous in both yeah. our our investigations that we do into extraordinary events but also being less uh, less understanding and slightly more aggressive about the facts because you know as far as i'm concerned and a lot of my associates we have got rampant snake oil salesmen taking place at the moment and it, it's getting it's getting out of hand it really is yeah, absolutely and look if we if we care about questions about consciousness if we care about uh, questions concerning the prospects of consciousness persisting after death, then uh, we need to be conscientious, right, with respect to how we go about our inquiry um, into these questions, um, such that we are adequately calibrated uh, to get true beliefs um, in, in this area and avoid false beliefs, and where necessary, withhold belief until such time as we have better evidence.
And I think what we need to do, and you and I need to discuss this, is to maybe think of even setting up some form of institute or society that will be far more rigorous than a lot of those out there at the moment and take these ideas forward into the 21st century. And I'll, I'll discuss this with you uh, privately um, in terms of this, but there's a number of academics I know that are very interested in doing exactly the same thing. So thank you very much, Michael. Enjoy the rest of your day. And for everybody else, thank you very much for listening in. Um, we lost Sarah earlier on because she had another meeting to go to, um, but suffice to say, thanks again. And uh, thanks for listening in. And my thanks to our wonderful guest, Professor Michael Sudduth from over there in Northern California. Thank you very much and goodbye.